Okay, uh, so some quick announcements. Uh, obviously, today is the last day of our uh, deep reinforced, uh, deep unsupervised learning lecture. Um, next semester in January, I'm likely to hold another course um, for those of you in SOC and beyond. We'd like to join. It will be during the daytime, though. Okay, so it'll be a slot probably in the afternoon or about. Uh, it's, it's, we're not certain yet, so it depends on interest. So, uh, yes, yeah, I will be offering a poll. So you guys can also tell me what time you, if you'd like to join, um, or when you'd like to. Okay, and it's open not just to 60 or 101 students, although I'm sure most of the PhD students, uh, you don't want to take a course that you don't have to, right? But sometimes it's good to take courses that uh, brought in here a few of you. So uh, as I was talking with a couple people, what I'm trying to do is um, uh, hold a deep uh, recommender systems course um, that will be multi-institutional. So I'm getting at least one faculty member from China who's my alumni from my group, um, who's done quite a lot of work in this area to also hold it at his institution. So it will be done through Zoom. So, uh, you know, the people on both sides will present and we can coordinate that way. Okay, so um, that should be fun because I think, uh, as we all know, our Chinese colleagues are getting really good, really good, very fast. Uh, and they have huge armies of people. So it's uh, very important to um, learn from them and uh, uh, be able to contribute to that dialogue. Um, so likely that'll be, um, you know, uh, one of the afternoons, uh, maybe for an hour. And it will also be a 6101 class. So uh, it's likely to have uh, PhD students, uh, but we have much fewer in the spring semester um, that will join. So um, again, I'm looking to all of our industry participants to see whether you're interested in that. Okay, so um, again, thanks for uh, joining the course and uh, participating in STEPS. Uh, I'm really sorry at during steps I was really too busy with the other course, uh, CS3244. Um, next semester I won't be teaching that course, but uh, um, okay, again, we're going to hold it uh, during steps because I think uh, hopefully for all of you, um, the project is a very important part of the component, right? I mean, otherwise you're just watching video lectures. I mean, you could do that on your own. So uh, um, uh, requiring you to be a little bit hands-on, I think uh, makes a very different feel for, for the course material. Okay, um, if you are a 6101 student, like all of you over sitting here, um, if you have any feedback, uh, you can let me know. You've already done another lab rotation with another group, so you can tell me um, well, which format you like or whether there are certain things uh, about this course that you like or don't like that uh, works better with another lab rotation. Okay, I would appreciate that feedback as well. Okay, so uh, with that, I'll let uh, Kevin take over for the first part. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let me see how I can, okay. And, and I'll be on the video. Uh, maybe you wanna change the color? Oh, okay, that's okay, that's okay. okay. So, okay, so I will start. Uh, I think today's lesson is about reinforcement learning. And uh, I will share the first part with the auxiliary task. And uh, before I start, I'm gonna say for reinforcement learning is, I think for me personally, the hardest part to understand in all the AI field. So I think somewhere in the middle, we may need someone else help to jump in to, to explain some part. And for those who are watching on YouTube, uh, if some part I, I explain it wrong, you can post on the comment section, okay. So uh, just to lay the ground, uh, it's a bit of the background of the reinforcement learning. I think for, for 6101 last semester is about reinforcement learning. And uh, if you haven't gone through that course or reinforcement learning is pretty new for you, it's a very short overview. So reinforcement learning is that the specific environment, given current state, choose the best policy to perform actions to minimize, sorry, to maximize the long-term reward. So basically we can see there are two important portions for the reinforcement learning. One is about agent, the other is environment. So the agent is the one that making the choices. So agent will come out with actions and the environment will give out the reward and it will bring to the next state. So 
uh, this is a formal definition. State is a representation is of what agent is observing at the given time. And the policy is the strategy to make action at a given time. So usually it's be uh, denoted by pi. And for reward, uh, that's the feedback provided by the environment. So I think for most of the reinforcement learning I've seen so far online, people like to use either the gaming or using the robotics to explain that. Uh, me, myself, find it particularly hard for me to appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate that work, but since I do not play, almost don't play game, and I don't play robots, I feel myself pretty difficult to understand that. So I want to use my own analogy to, to, to show this reinforcement, reinforcement learning, which you can imagine that you are drinking in a bar, and you see a, a girl over there, so you want to, that your objective is to take the girl out. So you, you yourself will be the agent and you can choose several different actions. Basically, you can sit around the girl and talk with uh, the girl. Perhaps her friend is around it. So every time we make an action, the environment, which is a girl herself, will either give you a reward or a penalty. So you can feel what she is saying to, to have a sense of you know, how good the state that we are in. And uh, for whatever you know, clever guys, he can change his policy due to the state it's in. So that's why we can see a you know, conditional thing over here. So given the state, we are going to choose different actions. And hopefully at the end, the goal is to receive the final reward is you can either ask for her, her number or get her out. So that's for the reinforcement learning as an overview. So I think every time when we talk about reinforcement learning, uh, this Bellman equation will comes out. So Bellman equation, which is basically telling us how good is uh, each individual state. So, so this one will give us a value function. So the value function is generally consists of two parts. Number one is this part, which is the reward that we receive uh, at this particular time step, and plus the future value functions. So uh, we can imagine this way, for whatever actions that we take, we may not receive an immediate reward, but whether uh, if that there is an immediate reward, that will be the best. Uh, if there is no, uh, we, there is a still a second part. So this part takes in the the future, the the reward, or oh, sorry, the the value of the next state, and there is a discounted factors over here uh, to discount for the future value. So add up these two together, the most immediate reward over here plus the future value state, it will consist of how valuable is this current state. And this is for the deterministic Bellman equation, which is basically whatever that we choose, it will definitely end up in the next state. Uh, but this is kind of like too ideal. Usually we will end up in this situation, which is a sto stochastic uh, thing. The biggest difference between a stochastic and a deterministic is for whatever that the action that we take, it doesn't, it's not guarantees that we will end up in the state that we want it to be. For example, whenever you say something to the girl, you may anticipate she has some reactions, but you know, it, it, it is not guaranteed. So there is a probability over here, uh, which denotes the ending in the state S prime by taking the action A at state S. So basically the format is still the same. We take the most immediate reward that we receive by doing this action plus on the value, the value of the next state times the probability that we'll be ending up in those states. So the Bellman equation generally tells us how valuable the current state is. And one more thing is this Q value. So Q value, Q value uh, is an add-on on top of this, the value function, which not on, only tells us how valuable a particular state is, it will tell us how valuable, how good, uh, by taking action A in the state S. Of course, by following a particular uh, policy. So uh, if we look at it, it's been calculated by discounting the long-term reward. So every time when we take an action at state S, it's been cal the, this Q value has been calculated by the expectation of all the future rewards that we receive. So, uh, of course, then the thing is very easy. For the objective of the reinforcement learning is to find the best policy. So we were always going for the best Q value. At this particular current state, 
take this particular action. So yeah, I hope my explanation is relatively correct. And again, uh, I don't think I personally resonate with all the gaming thing. So I will use the thing I'm most familiar with. Uh, in, for example, in soccer, although this, this screenshot is also taken from a game, but in the actual soccer, uh, we have a couple of the state and we have an action. For example, uh, there is a pretty famous tactics in soccer called Tiki Taka. I think the team Barcelona is the master of it. So at the, at the prime of the Barcelona's team, they have a very famous you know, midfielder, Xavi. So Xavi can take control of the ball uh, either at different position of the midfield. So he can, he can be either somewhere here or somewhere here or somewhere here. So he is holding the ball plus where he is in the midfield will be kind of like denoting the state he's in. And for the, all the action he can take, he can pass on to Messi, he can pass on to Iniesta, and he can also continue to dribble. So the Q values over here basically denotes that how valuable is each individual action he's going to take at one particular state. So for example, he is holding the ball at the mid left. And uh, uh, for those who are familiar with it, Iniesta is a pretty good the midfielder. So if passing to Iniesta, it will, res it will kind of like a good option. So although Messi is very good, uh, maybe you pass the ball to Messi at this particular time is not that good. But if let's say the Xavi is going to the box area, which you know uh, the Messi can just shoot, he can probably choose the best action is passing to Messi. And uh, for whoever that plays soccer, we know that dribbling around the box area is a terrible idea. So this kind of the this is a Q learning uh, Q value, sorry, in action. So uh, we can perceive the Q value as a table to store how valuable uh, in a numerical format uh, with one state and its particular action. So for the actual Q learning, sorry, for actual reinforcement learning, of course, we want to find the best policy by choosing whichever thing that gives us the highest Q value. So the, the way it does is this. So first we initialize the, the, the empty space for Q. And while Q has not converged yet, we can initialize the state and play. So during the playing, we can choose a policy, initialize a policy, and obtain the actions from the policy. And based on the action, we can get the next state. And we can see whether we get a reward for the next state. And how do we update this is using this particular function. So for those who are familiar with reinforcement learning, this could be pretty easy for you. So the alpha is basically the learning rate. And uh, this is the old kind of like the Q value of the last step. So for example, if let's say the alpha equals to uh, zero, means that we don't learn anything. Uh, so the Q value, the new Q value will just stay, stay as the same with the old Q value. So as we increase, increase the alpha, uh, the Q value will be updated more. And for the rest of the part, I think we are pretty kind of like familiar with. Uh, that's kind of like where we learn from the Bellman's equation. So we will update it with the immediate reward and the maximum Q value at the next step given this action. And we will update the step, the, the state based on, based on these. So uh, from what I understand is just like we are trying out different, different policies and to figure out how uh, the Q values will change according to this policy and gradually it will somehow converge to its best state. So you get a policy, any policy, So, 
Because the polys, because that row becomes the poly. No, no, the choice of column here, because each of the columns that you can see there is a particular action. Yes. Right? So it will take you to the next image. You are in this image here, ground state, and you take an action and you can either pass to me to that one possible action. Yeah. Or you can pass to the other guy, that's another possible action. So these are all possible courses of action which take you to the next step. Yes. Yeah. That's correct. Right. You can think of the first column of your state as our x slash. Mm -hmm. so basically, the, the input uh, of, of what we want to track. So, if I write in my particular state, right, then I uh, the policy is basically some type of what I'm saying, or dictionary, like the playbook, right? You open up the playbook, find out, okay, I'm, uh, you know, an RBA and I'm in Israel, so I just look it up. Okay, so I, I look up and I find out. This policy. entire table now will put your policy information. You start how to use it. The policy is saying which of the three actions are many more. Right? So if I look up in my policy, I'm happy and I'm in Israel. Right? Then the policy will say, oh, which of these three actions do I do? So I need to check the B. Because that is the highest. So I'll pay that's off. The, yeah, that's the policy that I have now. Okay. So the idea with a lot of these things is. Um, Policy is just to uh, uh, decide which one is the right? So it's just a matter. Even though I have many possible actions, uh, the policy is saying which action should I do. Right? So it's basically a look up thing. Okay, if you're in state one, then you need to do the right policy. Some assumption that, right? Like, uh, like you have a photocopy and a picture of the right? So you're in certain states that, you know, uh, even though there's many actions I can do in the photocopy, Uh, I, I, I think from what I understand, uh, policy is given state, choose the action. So uh, these are the just basic component of the reinforcement learning. So for the Q value, the table that we see over here, it's just a medium for us to choose the best policy. So usually uh, we just choose the best that's Q value. Best policy. Yeah. Going to right. passing to Inesta would be your best policy. Yes. But passing to Messi is also a policy. So you could decide to just, if you're choosing randomly, then probably don't. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. So the whole point is to try to find the optimal policy, right? And to, and to, and to do that, you need to have optimal key values. If you're able to um, have an optimal set of um, understanding about how the words happen given action different states, like what your key values are. You can always make the optimal policy by choosing the action with the highest key value. But yep. Of course, that means your key values have to be accurate, right? If you say you in incorrectly estimate the passing to any S that is the best thing in the best way of matching the variable, then your key values are wrong, right? So you don't have an optimal policy. Uh, on the phone, I just thought that the, uh, one, one way to be, like, becoming action could be just choosing the like action of which maximizing a key value, but also another way could be like introducing some other units and uh, not always taking a maximum Q value action. So that maybe like it makes more like introduce some model more like robust and then to, to a more diverse action to doing to get to a like go to them better Yeah, so I don't know whether you're going to cover that with other people. Does anyone cover exploration versus exploitation? No. Okay. So there's the terms there. You think of the locality and geographic to conduct exploration or exploitation, but you hold the policy position. Yeah. I mean, in the basic key learning, we don't do that, but ultimately, we try to do that. So you need to run this on what I'm standing for. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, like uh, Taka was saying, usually there's some type of uh, trade off between exploitation and, and exploration. Right? When we, we, we have very good key values, they're close to being correct. We choose to explore them more. Right? But at the beginning, when we have no data, maybe we, we don't always take the, the most uh, 
currently operable, I'm sure that because we don't believe our, our values are correct. Okay, so that's a bit of the background. And for the reinforcement learning, we will always face a problem. Uh, you know, okay, so this cake has been, the, the picture has been used over and over again. In this context, this cake has been used for, you know, there's only one reward at the, at the very end. Uh, yeah, so in many interesting domains, intrinsic rewards are only rarely observed. Uh, like, you know, dating a girl is also the same. Uh, the reward only at the end. So you're kind of like difficult to choose, you know, whether you should say this or say that. So this is always a problem in the real life, and particularly when we train for the reinforcement learning, uh, we are kind of like taking a long, long time because the reward is kind of like, you know, too sparse. And uh, especially for the early actions that we take, we may not kind of like feel the, the sweetness of getting the reward. So this is the problem that we want to we want to resolve. So uh, for, for Solving this, uh, this lecture is particularly about representation learning. So there are four parts, auxiliary loss, state representation, exploration, and unsupervised skills discovery. So I will cover the first part for auxiliary losses. Uh, this has been uh, discussed in detail in this paper, reinforcement learning with unsupervised auxiliary tasks. So uh, I think the paper is well written. Uh, I can understand almost 60% of it. So I think, yeah, if you haven't read it, you can, you can read it. So I think uh, this, the way of training the reinforcement learning task is slightly different in this case, uh, is using an actor critic uh, network or actor critic strategies to, to train it. So basically uh, these are kind of like, there are two uh, learners over there. One is the ac actor, One is actor, the other is critic. So this is com coming to uh, pretty much of a similar thing with what we do for, for GAN. So GAN has two networks to train as well. One is discriminator, the other is generator. So this one, one is actor, one is critic. So actor is decided which action to take and critic tells us actor how good is this action was and how it should adjust. So uh, I post a blog post in the Slack so I think basically this is pretty much of a, you know, uh, easier to understand with analogy. So in the blog, it says that the actor is a little boy. So the little boy will always trying to learn from, 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 from the world, how, how he should behave. And for the critic, as you can see from the name, uh, someone is trying to criticizing you, uh, which is his boy's mother. So the boy's mother will tell us the boy whether you are actually doing good or not. And uh, putting in the term of reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning usually have two, two kinds of a learning. Uh, number one is called policy iteration. The number two is called value iteration. So at this part, the actor will serve as the policy, uh, which is, you know, the actor is trying to choose what is the best actions to take. And the critic will serve as the value, uh, which, you know, we will tell you whether this is good or not. And coming back to the case of dating a girl, uh, I'm not sure whether you guys are aware of it. Uh, this is not advocating this, but there is a service called PUA, called Pickup Artist, which is basically someone will help you to date a girl. So usually how this thing works is you will have a mentor to teach you what to say at what scenario. And uh, you can have a live chat with, I, sorry, I have not used it before. I just know how, <laughs> how it works. Uh, so disclaimer, yeah. So, so uh, you, will, you will kind of like, you know, going to the bar and you're trying to date a girl and uh, you are kind of like, you have to tell your mentor what is actually going on and your mentor is trying to mentor you all along the way. So at this... Is there a pickup boy site? <laughs> I really don't know about that. <laughs> so, so in this case, uh, the, the, the guy uh, is the actor and the mentor will be a critic. So you will be actually in the environment to, to, to actually see uh, what's the response and to figure out what's the best action. And there will be a critic that tells you, okay, how valuable is this state? Whether you're actually close to your goal or you are deviate too much from your goal. 
So that's for the actor critic. Uh, if this is going onto the YouTube, you can cut off this part. Uh, I have not used it anyway. Uh, so for for this this version, uh, for this paper, there's a newer version of actor critic been using. It's called A2C. It's called Asynchronous Advantage Actor Critic. So I personally cannot understand it pretty well, but I can grasp the overall meaning of it. It's just basically there are different agents is trying to receive uh, the environment at different time step. And uh, yeah, so this one, the, the outcome will be, it will turning out the policy and the value function. So uh, Prof, you wanna say anything for this? So So the so just now we have mentioning two things. Uh, first is Q value. Uh, the other is the state value. So the advantage, if I'm right, is been denoted by this. So each Q value uh, is we can perceive it as the value of this particular state plus a advantage. That's all I know. Yeah. Basically, what you want to do is choose a value. So, uh, so this paper is apparently they are trying to optimize uh, how the agent can play a game. It's a very boring game, I would say, uh, but this is uh, kind of like the, the agent is trying to get the fruit. So once you get the fruit, you are kind of like, you know, have a reward. So the base A3C agent is using uh, LSTM, uh, combining a ConvNet with LSTM. Uh, this is, a, of course, a sequential model. So every single state will go in as the pixel. So the pixel will undergo the, 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 the uh, ConvNet to learn a representation and will pass the representation into LSTM. And uh, at each step, there will be a value and there will be uh, policies coming out as per basic uh, actor critic uh, agent do. And there is a replay buffer. So the replay buffer is how we used to train for the deep nets, which is basically storing a couple of the experience over here uh, to remove some of the correlation for, for the sequential time step. And what the, what the authors did is he put on several auxiliary losses tasks in order to make sure that for these agents when they are playing game, they are not only receiving the reward at the very end uh, in order to speed, speed up and achieve the high efficiency high efficiency learning. So he tried three tasks. Number one is pixel control. Number two is reward prediction. Number three is value function replay. So let's go into each individual one. So the pixel control is uh, conceptually what the author's trying to illustrate is he wants to make sure that the 
the agent is always moving. So uh, to prevent the cases like you are stuck in at somewhere. So it will put an auxiliary task for the agent itself to make sure that at the T step and T plus one step, the pixel can changes a lot. Okay, that's how I can explain. Pixel changes. Okay, so uh, the assumption is the changes in the perceptual stream often correspond to the important events in an environment. So right now you're seeing the wall, but once you change it to some other places, the, the assumption is there is something going on and uh, it can correspond to an important event. I think for me conceptually, this is not very intuitive. It doesn't mean that you know, when you change a scene, there's an important event. But obviously, these are very important assumptions to make. So there will be a separate policy train to maximize the changing in the pixels. So for example, if let's say this is a three by three pixels, it will be, it will be given an auxiliary loss if at different time step, the pixel changes its color. So for example, this is this gray. If at the next time step, it's becoming grayer or blacker, uh, it will give this agent quite a bit of the reward. So it encouraged the agent to change the, the pixels. So it's just basically like, you know, encourage the, encourage the agent to, to change the tune, to do uh, some exploration. So that's for the pixel control. So the second thing it does is the reward estimation. So they will train an additional uh, network to estimate whether there will be a reward in the next time step. So it's a pretty standard classification problem. It will have three labels, positive, negative, and no reward. So it will be separate things to train to see whether I can receive the reward in the next time step. And the last thing is value function replay. This thing, I have to admit, I understand almost nothing. So I can read out this. So resampling recent historical sequence from the behavioral policy distribution and performing extra value function regression. Uh, does anyone probably understand what this is trying to do? I personally don't understand what you're trying to do. Okay, so. Uh, basically all of these auxiliary loss Even looking at that slide there, right? You see T, T, minus, uh, T minus 200, so uh, since there, I guess, can happen, right? Mm. So perhaps the classifier is saying, oh, I see some green here that looks like an apple, and I'm going to predict that I'm going to be seeing those apples kind of like in the classification step. And then the value function replay, uh, let's see, I think this is leading to something like the uh, Sequence. So it's kind of like make the 
Okay, so if, so if we combine all these tasks, the thing is called Unreal. Okay, so Unreal is not a separate agent, it's just agent combining all these tasks. So if all these tasks, three tasks has been combined inside, it has the best performance. So this is a basic A3C. Uh, it taking a whole lot of the step over here. And uh, yeah, so it can achieve 50, 50 4% of the human normalized performance. So I believe maybe in the future this could be gradually better, but apparently what we can see is if we're adding on all those auxiliary tasks inside it, the thing performs the best. And I'm pretty, pretty kind of like counterintuitive, counterintuitive. It's just adding on pixel control. Uh, it's just such a, you know, uh, I don't know whether it's a valid assumption or not. Uh, it can already achieve 81%. So basically, yeah, pixel control is a pretty important task to to perform. And if we act I think that really has to do with the particular model, right? Their particular model is their their searching an area for the food, right? So um, it's for each of these four in these cases, right? Um, but let's say you found the food already, but um, you basically have to ask the customer to the start, right? So if you want the food for them, so if you make the assumption that Maybe not be the same, right? I mean, for example, in, in software games, maybe you have the same thing. You have deja vu that you in this game before, and then task number seven, task number seven, you may not have this uh, idea that you want to explore more. You want to explore the strategy that you're not going to need because you put the situation in this point. Yeah. So, uh, and they also present it for the pixel control. They have two strategies. Number one is just directly control the final pixel. Uh, number two is the feature control. So feature control is just basically in the, the latent, in the latent variable layers. They will extract, hand extract some of, sorry, they will extract some features out from it. So uh, this feature control is basically from the latent space, how big the latent space is changing, whether the pixel control is the final, final pixel. And what it does, what it find out is, you know, both of them uh, can can result in pretty big of the performance jump. But if we just do it on the final pixel, uh, it performs better. And uh, yeah, so this basically shows the same thing. And I think just as Prof said, uh, this is, you know, varies from game to game. So in this one, the pixel control is really a good good thing to do. So yeah, so this is just basically this part. And uh, uh, just one little thing. I think this one is pretty, pretty much like what we do as a human being because usually our task and the reward is too far away. What we want to do is just breaking down our, our reward kind of like into the smaller pieces or we can find some auxiliary things to satisfy us. For example, if, if let's say we want to be a better athlete, better soccer player, it's a pretty long way to take, but kind of like we can breaking down this into small, small little pieces to give us some kind of like reward along the way. So if we do the training for this week, we're gonna receive a reward. And do the training for the next week, we will receive a reward. So yeah, I think that is what I have. And uh, yeah, that will be it. Sorry, bro. Uh, how can I open the? Uh, how can I open the slide from the program? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah, just one. okay. Thank you. Okay. And then hopefully it'll last.
Yeah, thanks, Kevin. And next, I will um, briefly introduce uh, how to use the state, uh, how to do state presentation, uh, representation uh, in reinforcement learning. And then, um, one of the main uh, insight in, uh, in this part is that how to uh, convert the observations into a state. Mm. This paper is called a world model, and uh, it was published at NIPS uh, last year. And it is a really influen uh, influential uh, paper uh, in the uh, IO area. And the, mm, the main framework of this paper is like this. Mm. And it, uh, it, it mainly uh, consists of three parts. The first part is the uh, VAE parts. Uh, it's this part. Uh, it is the first part. Uh, sorry. And the second part is the RN part. And the uh, third part is the uh, controller part. And it is called uh, V. Um, this part is called V. And this part is called uh, M. And this part is called controller C. And this, uh, it is really like a, a conventional software framework MVC. <laughs> Yeah, and um, the first part of VAE is for uh, how to convert the observation into a short representation. Uh, how do you com uh, convert the observation, like an image, into a, a lower dimensional vector? And the second part, M, is, uh, is the main model of uh, this framework. It is for how to encode uh, each, uh, uh, each time step into different uh, hidden state. And, uh, it can also for predicting the uh, next uh, time step. That is for uh, how to train a model in a virtual world created by only the model instead of the uh, real world. And the, the iron part is the, um, I think it's the main contribution of this paper. And the second part is the controller. The controller is the, uh, the most, uh, is the easiest um, part of this paper. And it is only just a one layer of uh, perceptron, um, just around uh, 8,000, uh, 800 uh, parameters. And I will detail how the, these three parts uh, work in this paper. And the first part is the VAE part. Um, so uh, first assume that we are playing a computer game. And uh, what we observe is that uh, each, image, uh, each image at each time step and then uh, we want to encode, uh, encode we want, to, uh, want our model to consider the information extracted from uh, each image. But actually, if the, uh, if the image is 1,000 uh, by 1,000, so we, we will get uh, around 1 million uh, pixels here. So directly uh, input uh, such, uh, such big, uh, such large data uh, into a model. That means we need a lot of parameters to, uh, to encode them. So the first part, well, we need to use a VAE model uh, to uh, reduce the dimension of such uh, image. Uh, this is the first part. And why to use VAE here? Uh, that is a variential autoencoder here. Why to use uh, VAE here uh, is, uh, is that uh, VAE, uh, compared to the uh, conventional uh, autoencoder, VAE can create um, uh, in VAE, the uh, procedure is like this. We just use uh, encoder E here. So we can uh, output the uh, mean value and the stand, uh, standard deviation here. And then we use this to, to construct a, a hidden vector Z here. And then we use this heat, uh, Z here to uh, uh, fit, the, fit it into the decoder. And then we can reconstruct the uh, X, Y hat. Uh, sorry, sorry, X hat. And then uh, we just uh, we just use the uh, reconstruction loss between them two to train or uh, train the whole model. Uh, that is the concept of the uh, VAE. So uh, compared to a conventional autoencoder, uh, we have the mean value and the standard uh, deviation here. So we can do uh, we can sample another uh, sam uh, we can sampling another uh, samples from uh, this uh, distribution. So uh, we can uh, regard it as, uh, as a generative model, uh, like again also. Um, so 
uh, we why why sh so why should we use the VNE here is that uh, in the RN part we want to pr predict the future stamp. So uh, if we can um, we can get the distribution uh, of this image, so we can uh, randomly uh, sample an image uh, from uh, this distribution as the future stamp. So we can uh, train our model in a dreamlike world, uh, not the real world. Uh, that is the main insight of uh, the VAE part. And the uh, and the next, I will uh, in the following part, I will show uh, the results of the uh, reconstruction part. And the second part is the uh, RN part. As we all know, that RN is used to uh, encode some sequential data. So in this part, uh, we just uh, we first train a VAE model. VAE model only use the uh, reconstruction error, so uh, it can be trained first. Uh, once we get the trained VAE, and then uh, we use the um, short, uh, the lower dimensional uh, hidden vector C to denote each uh, observation, and then fit it into uh, each time step of uh, RN uh, to get its uh, hidden state of uh, each time step, uh, that is H. And notice that uh, it is not the conventional I, uh, it use a MDN, uh, sorry. We can denote that uh, there is a MDN here. MDN denotes that um, if we use a conventional analysis like this, uh, it will output uh, H, uh, H1, H2 uh, to HN. And then uh, we just add a MDN here uh, to uh, make the RN can, uh, can predict one distribution here. So, uh, so if we, uh, MDN, uh, the full name of MDN is like a mixed troll uh, distribution network or, or and so. And uh, if we can get a distribution, uh, distribution here, that means our model can become a generative model. So we can sample uh, from this distribution to construct our future time step. So uh, the distribution is like this. Given uh, action t, uh, that means the action uh, at this uh, time step. And the zt is the, uh, is the uh, low dimensional hidden vector of uh, each image, and the HT means the uh, hidden, uh, uh, hidden state of the RNA at the, this time step. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is the second part. And the last part is the, uh, sorry, uh, last part is the, uh, I can first erase it. And the last part uh, we can notice that is the uh, controller part. The controller part, uh, we, uh, we first uh, uh, fed the, uh, the hidden vector Z of each image and the uh, hidden state extracted from the uh, RN as the uh, controller's input. And then we can get the uh, best action here. Uh, it is a really uh, simple model. I just said that uh, they just use a uh, Simple uh, uh, one layer of perception here, so you can, uh, they can get the best uh, ac action here, and then the best action can be fed into two parts. The first part is uh, the action will uh, inf uh, impact the uh, have impact on the environment, and the second part is that the action will uh, change the state of current uh, RNA. So uh, I think mm, this model is not really theoretical but uh, really insightful uh, due to the, uh, the framework uh, design. Mm, and so, uh, sorry, Prof, can I open a demo here? Yeah. yeah. I don't know how to open the website. Yeah, um, let's see. Uh, okay, thank you.
So I think um, the authors have do a great job you know, in this part so they can <laughs> be published at NIPS. Uh, this is a, a demo website for uh, this paper. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, the paper was uh, presented by uh, Jürgen uh, uh, Schmidt Huber, yeah, uh, the preventer of SLSTM. Mm. And I think um, I think the framework presented uh, at this website can help you better understand this model. Mm, it is like uh, it is like the uh, figure show that um, we just first at each time step, uh, our agent can receive an observation from the environment, and then the uh, the vision uh, vision model that is a VAE can encode the high dimensional observation into a lower. Uh, dimensional uh, latent vector. And then the memory uh, will integrate the historical codes to create a representation that can predict the future state. And then a small controller uh, uses the representations from uh, both vision module and the uh, RNN module to select the good, uh, what is the best uh, actions uh, to do at this time step. And the final part is that the agent will uh, perform the uh, action uh, that go back uh, that go back and affect the environment. Uh, that is the main framework of this um, this uh, this paper. And the and they just do uh, two kinds of experiments on two uh, games. The first game is the car racing, uh, like the uh, slide shows. Uh, you can see that there is uh, one uh, one red car. Uh, uh, racing on a uh, on a track, and uh, and the game uh, and the rule of this game is that the car can only uh, run on the uh, track uh, instead of the green uh, green part like some uh, grass. And uh, the VA uh, first the demo is about the VAE reconstruction. Uh, first, the left uh, the left figure means that the original uh, original uh, image. And uh, and the left part uh, and the right part is the reconstruction part. You can see that we can randomize uh, this uh, hidden vector to show how to gen generate a new uh, image. So we can uh, simply specify each uh, dimension to change the uh, track size or, or the track shape. And um, this is uh, a VAE reconstruction part. And uh, this is a dynamic version of, uh, of this figure. You can see that uh, the reconstruction uh, performance is really good. And uh, in this part, it's uh, if we just use VAE, uh, not uh, not using the RN part, we can see that the car will um, will rel relatively random uh, run on the tracks. But if you combine with the RN model, that means we can predict on more future, so we can uh, better uh, make decisions. Here, you can see that the car will be better than uh, the first one. Uh, and this part is for uh, there is a temperature parameter, hyperparameter to control uh, the uncertainty in, in this system. But it is not detailed in the paper part, but uh, but only presented in the uh, in their code. So I will not detail this part. Uh, but you can see that if uh, if I change the uh, temperature parameter uh, more hi uh, higher, you can see that the tracks will be uh, more random. And, uh, and the next part is another game, so I will not uh, go through this uh, this part. So uh, I will detail uh, how they uh, conduct this uh, experiment. The first step is to uh, they first collect ten thousand uh, run uh, rollouts from a random uh, policy. That means. Uh, they just randomly uh, run these uh, cars on the tracks and they can uh, collect a lot of data uh, with both labels and the features. 
And the second step is that uh, they train a VAE to encode the frame into just um, 32 dim dimensional uh, hidden vector Z. And, uh, and then they train uh, MDN RNN uh, to model uh, this probability. This, pro uh, this probability is a conditional uh, probability. And the final step is that they just uh, use a really easy, uh, usually a really simple uh, model here is a linear controller here to maximize the expected accumulated reward of the uh, rollout. Uh, and you can see that the equation is really simple. And, and the parameter uh, count also shown in this table. You can see that compared with uh, the, uh, the first two uh, modules, uh, the controller has really um, uh, small uh, parameter size. Sorry, yeah, sorry. So for this model models, are there are three types of model one, the VAE and the RNN and the particular one. So this model is like train each three model individually or do they train the model at once? Uh, you mean that uh, how, how, how they train the yeah, model? Yes. Yeah. Uh, first, we train a VAE just uh, using the images. Uh, yeah. Uh, VAE is uh, the first train part. And, and we just train the uh, RM part and uh, controller part in an end to end manner. Oh, this way. Yeah, end to end manner. Yeah. Yeah, I think the whole procedure is really simple. Uh, yeah, but it's really insightful for the downstream applications. Yeah. So you guys can think about this part of And what the author claim that they try to design more uh, complex modules like VAE and uh, but they try to uh, propose a simple part for the controller. The world model mainly consists of the first two modules. So they try, uh, they take more efforts on the first two parts. Yeah. Yes, and um, and these two figures are showing the uh, effectiveness of the reconstruction, uh, as I mentioned before. And I think these two figures are more uh, insightful. And the left figure is that um, only, in uh, only using the VAE part and the left side um, is that combining with the RM part. You can see that if, you, uh, if we use RM part, uh, sorry. If you, uh, if you just use uh, RM here, you can, look through the uh, former part. Yeah, but here we cannot see the future part. So I think uh, the RM part enables the, our model to have some, uh, some abilities for, of Im imagination. Mm, and here is the result. Uh, it is a competition and they get the state of the art performance and really significant outperform the second one. And this is uh, also the framework. Uh, and this is another uh, another uh, experiment uh, data set uh, in this figure, uh, in this uh, paper. And this is called uh, a game called Doom, uh, but I never played. <laughs> it's before your time. <laughs> <laughs> My generation. We have seen it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and it just sort of Doom 3. Yeah, that's much bigger. Yeah. This one was one of the first 
very games that you can uh, yeah, really really put a lot of Okay. I think when I'm, I'm in my childhood, I have seen a magazine show this, uh, yeah. this camera. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and um, in, uh, in this paper, they just, perform, uh, they just conduct some experiment on, on, uh, on this uh, data set. And they just change this part. Uh, sorry, this part is uh, also the uh, race, uh, car race. But if we will change it to the survival time, survival time so we can uh, we can generalize uh, this method to this game yeah? <laughs> just to change the reward function uh, and the temperature as, as I mentioned before it is to control the uncertainty in this model and they also get the state of, of, of the art results Oh, sorry. This is more better. On this side, Let's see. You just show the desktop. Yeah. And then we will start from where we were. And you were on, uh, I forget which slide. So the problem is, of course, you can't annotate anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, this is too far, right? So I wonder where I can. Yeah, uh, okay. Thank you. So you can just point with the mouse, but I can't. Yeah, and uh, this is the how to train this model. Uh, train this model, and uh, it is like the first framework. So I will not detail it again. Just one question. Yeah. Uh, so the VA is condensing an entire one picture with, at any given point of magnitude. So one picture into some very low dimensional, super dimensional, heavy dimensional right? Yeah. So in yeah. RNN, when you feed, you feed just not one vector into the RNN. Along with some action of gene response or something that you know, linear vector representation of that, that AT equal to W time of the Uh, yeah. Um, so it's kind of taking a picture of where there is an action and then coming up with its own internal representation of the combination again. Uh, I'm sorry, I just regarded the VAE part as a simple. Uh, Feature extractor. Feature. Yeah, just, just one representation yeah. of it given again at one time step. There's only one image. And yeah. there's no real temporal aspect there yet. Right? It's just one image. Right? Yeah. It's one image goes into the RNN. Yeah. RNN is only seeing the image as of now, just now. Yeah. Right? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's only in the future. In the, that HD is getting passed on to the next yeah. step. So in the future, it will start. Having some memory of the past. You know? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The VAE has no memory at all. VAE is just always yes. giving it just that time of step. So yeah. RNN, yeah. as you go forward, is that edge which gets passed on, keeps having memory yeah. of the past. Yeah. yeah. And that A is somehow taking these two, and that A is also getting passed on. But in your original paper, the A is not getting passed on. But yes. A is only at this time step, like the image. Yeah. I think it is a really uh, general framework in spatial temporal area. Just use a, a spatial temporal feature extractor at the uh, bottom level. Mm -hmm. And then we extract uh, the uh, features uh, from the original images. And then uh, we put, uh, we get the uh, features from each time step into the RNN. And then we can output the hidden set of uh, each time step and then make the final uh, prediction or the inference task. Yeah, it is a general framework. Yeah, so we don't do not uh, need to specify different uh, features extractor at each time step. We do not that, uh, do not do that. If you want to do that, you can uh, you can use uh, some like uh, dynamic graph embedding, uh, like some techniques like this. Yeah. I think it is a popular trend in uh, in this year's KDD. 
covers. Yeah. <laughs> and there are many, uh, there are many paper for uh, co uh, covering the uh, dynamic spatial temporal correlation. So they can, uh, so they can just uh, construct a dynamic graph over uh, some, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, they construct graph over a lot of sen uh, sensors deployed in real world, uh, like the loop detector in roads. We want to do traffic prediction. So how to uh, construct the dynamic graph over these sensors? Yeah. yeah so it is, uh, mm, uh, I think it is a uh, uh, probable, a probable future direction of the um, of the research to improve the feature extraction part. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, that's all about the world model, and I think um, I think the main insight behind this model is simple. And I think if we uh, want to use uh, the insight of uh, the paper into my research area is that um, we can just use uh, the imagination uh, model, the RM part, uh, to generate a lot of uh, samples uh, for um, my cases. That is because um, in my research area, there is no, uh, real, uh, no, no really rich uh, examples uh, in my cases. So I want to use this, maybe I can use this word model to create some uh, virtual samples for the model training. Uh, that is because if you use RN to encode the historical time step, uh, you can definitely uh, predict the length part. Yeah. So maybe we can use the length part uh, to construct a dream like board for the model training, like this paper. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's all for, for this paper. And I will, um, and next will come uh, Taishi for the next part. Yeah, thank you. So you, you can only use the, the laptop. Um, so if you want to draw anything, you have to draw on the board. Okay. Yeah. Board. Sorry about Sorry. that. It's okay. Uh, so uh, so the paper just pre present just now is actually uh, uh, given some environment like some an image. We just observe this image and and transfer to some current state. But why not just we, why not we, uh, besides we, besides this, we can also. Yeah, go ahead. There's no signals. Yeah, it should be okay. Yeah, there you go. We need to go. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, we can also uh, take take the encoded state and some other actions or some controls and to predict the next state. It, this actually has the benefits if we want to, to do long time sequence prediction. So, so this paper called embed to control, uh, the, the algorithm is called embed control. This paper is not its name. So actually uh, like this pendulum and for, for, for this graph, if we, if we give some control, like to give some force from the right to from, from the left, we want to predict uh, how this pendulum, like the, the movement or just like some, uh, it will, uh, some, uh, we want to, uh, actually we want to predict the row, pix row pixels Rather than some uh, classical op stochastical optimal control problem that only control considers that uh, few 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 dimensional because considering uh, pixels uh, a whole image is very challenging in this in in this area, and this paper is actually presented in 2015, uh, and I actually don't know how how the research is going on up to date. So, uh, can we perform on um, model based RL? Starting from row, row images, uh, yes, this paper gives a positive answer. And the standard, standard 
algorithm would fail in pixel space. And uh, actually, we can regard the, the, the row pixel at, at time xt like. So if we so we want to predict the uh, row pixels uh, from uh, from some some final state like x n and in the median state like x t we this the nonlinear dynamics is said that we took x t minus one and some control and do do some function. Such function could be like some take some gradients to, uh, to to another function like this, and plus some noise, and this noise is like you say it's Gaussian, Gaussian noise, and to do this in the row pixel space is actually very hard, and this paper is try to try to embed the latent space and to reduce to reduce this challenge, uh, to, to alleviate this challenge. And what we do is like we we go to some latent space and this is some function about the previous latent space and plus some, some noise. Okay. Uh, this as we can see in this figure and we want to to uh, to predict the next state latent space from this z and uh, plus the control. Okay. And the system we consider is the pendulum, the card pole, and the trailing arm. So, and the main ingredients is like the main contributions of the, this paper is two main parts. One is the very vari variational autoencoder in encoding this to this. And the other is the locally linear latent space model, is the dynamics of the latent space model. Like it's local locally linear means like uh, in in global, you are like some continuous tra tra trajectory of uh, of this Z. But uh, in practice you can you can't like optimize this uh, continuous trajectory. We can do the linear linearization trick in uh, in some time time interval, and we, we regard this as some uh, linear linear transformation. So, um, and this is the visualization of of a linear uh, quadratic. Regulator. So the objective is the co is quadratic. So is why it is quadratic, and uh, so this arrows is actually, I think it's calculated from from this gradient of some uh, differentiable function, and we have the the dynamics in in this whole space, and if we use from some starting point like like here, and the trajectory of the latent space is some continuous continuously uh, we but actually I think in practice this trajectory could, could could not be like that ideal because we have the noise and this and we and I think the trajectory could be like this uh, so remember the local Linearization trick, and for for this latent t, we just we just uh, calculate it this function and regard it as a mean, and plus some Gaussian noise, and we get the next state. This is actually the transition of latent space, and this transition of the latent space it is actually also correlated to to this Bellman equation is we uh, the Bellman equation is the 
uh, sorry, is the is the cost of the Z and the control, and is the the expectation taking over uh, some terminal cost Z and mu plus the sum of some instantaneous cost. And to solve this Bellman equation, we can the uh, techniques like ILQR can translate, like optimize it, op the optimization in this equation to the dynamic to the to to this dynamics. So uh, this is the the inference model. Like we can uh, inference model and the generative mo generative model like in the, in the VAE, and inference model is like to to inference the latent space from the low pixels, and how can we guarantee this? We can decode it back to to the low pixel by ge generative model, and besides, we want to, uh, in VAE we we want to minimize the KL divergence from the prior like the Gaussian. Of the latent space to to the to the uh, inference model. <clears throat> and uh, the the key requirements in uh, in the latent space is three parts. That is, it shall capture a sufficient information about XT, so so the other use the techniques of VAE, and we want to to predict in long time in 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 long time in long term time series. So we want to like in prediction the uh, next time size time time step we could we could maybe uh, out of distribution, and so. In in long term synchronous, the errors could be accumulated, and and the final state of the prediction could be very inaccurate. And we want to somehow guarantee that uh, the consecutive consecutive uh, latency latency space prediction be some be very uh, very near near. So this is actually another KL number use between them, and I will show this later. That is the third, the third uh, requirement, is that correct? Yeah, is yeah. Is, is the, yeah, the collinearizable. Yeah. Well. Yes. And so this is the a figure of the of the dynamics because we we currently only have this step uh, uh, this steps the row pixels of the and the next step row pixels and plus the control is the ut so we can use these three ingredients to 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 map to uh, the latent space and the transition model is like is like the transition between the zt and the zt plus one is this question. So we're learning U T. I mean, Actually, in in this, in this architecture, I haven't showed this whole whole picture because in this uh, in in this paper, it it they actually has three net networks: the inference network, and decoder network, and the transition network. The transition network is actually the transition is some. I think it's uh, simply uh, an MLP. Of it. you can input this ZT, and and you can uh, encode some some information and then decode it to ZT plus one, and uh, and I'll show show it show it later. Okay. Uh, just before, uh, because C T uh, like I said, variational or encoder we can train like the very earlier. Yeah. 
on our own to get given an image you can ultimately teach a series of images yeah, yeah. to okay. get the zt yeah. and zt plus one is a given like you know current state is zt and future we, series of video we we don't know zt plus one uh, in, we know in the sense that okay uh, meaning we train like i if i have given zt i mean a series of images zt zt plus two zt plus two then yeah. from zt you want to predict zt plus one somehow yeah and the the only thing that we are basically predicting zt plus one given zt is we have to start learning ut is the one which is going to basically help us yeah so this whole thing is ut at various step that zt plus one zt plus two so ut ut plus one ut yeah. So like yes, yes. learn this what you call control, right? This yes, you to learn control. this optimal control. Yeah. Okay, this is the locally linear dynamic like and dynamics is also known as the transition model, uh, which is the third network. Is this uh, orange or some or red uh, network that uh, if we give a specific dispelling equation and we give some function that is differentiable, like we can we can differentiate and that z should be capture uh, sufficient information and then the the transition model like this this is this is actually some general model this m function. But uh, we can actually write it to a very specific one, like mu t plus d t and o t. Sorry, u t plus o t plus d t. And this is the specific equation derived from here, and using techniques of I, 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 FUR. And this, this model is, is actually here, the Q hat, Z hat, Z, U, is actually given, given current Z and control, we, uh, we can model the next day, like the Z hat, by using this equation. And this equation, a T and B T here is actually some Jacobian matrix. It's actually the gradient because uh, in in dynamics we have two category gradients, and this is it T minus one and U T is the control. O T is I don't know some like other variables, and W T is the Gaussian noise. So if we want to to model this in a whole like end to end, end to end way, and we want to differentiate in 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 this manner by doing such equations, like we we call them, uh, and and you, we we want to train some net networks this way is actually impractical because it can't be derived. This is actually a discrete state. We can't derive on it, and recall that the. The tricks in the introduced in Marichal Bayesian is like we can do the non-parameterizing trick, and we can again introduce a new network called this HQ trans, and we can encode the previous state ZT to some AT, BT, and OT, and plus a uh, plus the UT, and we can decode back back to some zt plus one. So this, this is the loss function. This loss, this loss function is actually the simple uh, uh, Bay loss function is the ELBO, derived from ELBO of, by guarantee, the, the inference model from the uh, the prior is p, and this is inference model. And besides, we we also want to to consider this transition model. It's like 
here we have to add another uh, constraint is this KL divergence. The KL di this KL divergence is actually to minimize the distance uh, of the inference model and the transition model. The inference model is this Q phi and the transition model is the Q phi hat. So, uh, so remember there is actually three networks. So the whole the whole loss function is like this. And if we have x t plus one, we can encode it. We can put it into an inference model, and we can get z t plus one. And the former, the predicted z t plus one is calculated from the the red, like the transition network, and and we want to constrain this two calculated uh, latent space uh, guaranteed by this KL divergence. Okay, so overall, there's three re requirements of this model. The first one is an autoencoder, and the second one, if we want to predict in long time sequences, we have to guarantee. Uh, the distance of the inference model and the transition model is like to minimize the KL divergence of between them. And plus, we have uh, the prediction must be locally linearizable for all value control, control magnitudes. So it's like shown here is the linearization trick. Uh, this is the overall whole picture. So we have inference model generating model. And the, Ber the Bernoulli di distribution here is actually the row pixel in, in this paper is, is the black and white. So the, so the Bernoulli is actually enough for, them, for, for us to generate this zero one picture. Is this generating model is actually simply Bernoulli. And uh, the, transi the transition model showed here is this Q hat and overall loss function. And here is the result of this paper. Uh, we, we can see that if we, if we, yeah, if we, uh, here is the initial state. If we give a force like from, from the left to the right and the predicted sequence is actually very, very near to the, the ground truth sequence. So this is the pendulum prediction of this paper. And this is the result. Actually, this paper is the first paper to, to do such things. So it actually only compare with some baseline models. The baseline models is really some only use VAE to predict or nonlinear or global E2C. So it, it, these are just the baseline, the baselines, not for the formal papers. And this is just a, the fig, the comparison, the, the figures the comparison is actually, this model achieves very high prediction accuracy, but in only in 2015. So this is about this paper is to, uh, so I think the, the RL here is like this Bellman equation and we transform it from this to, uh, uh, to a stochastical optimal control problem. Is this what, what, what this paper do? So thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, so I will introduce two parts of this presentation. The first part is the representation learning in reinforcement learning. And the second part is the unsupervised skill discovery. So here we can see there are some methods for exploration. These ways of exploring are basically good, but there is actually something else that people tend to do, what we haven't uh, covered yet, uh, which is that you might want to learn skills and be able to reuse those skills. So it is just the skill trans transfer. So here I present the traditional view on the representation learning and reinforcement learning. A lot of representation learning is about turn, turning the observations, it's just O, into states. Because state is the fundamental summary of what you are looking at. And we have seen many more than the works than the listed on this slide. But here we can have an alternative view on representation learning. That is important. But how about learning representations on the behaviors? Because maybe if you know how to run or we know how to open doors, those are behaviors that we can reuse and explore more quickly in the future. So standard exploration proceeds by random actions or preservations of the parameters, or maybe some exploration bonuses and so forth. So why is this so important? Let's see the following examples. Imagine you are an ant robot and you get dropped in the world that you don't get to see where the reward is, but it turns out that the reward is always somewhere on the semi-circle. Semi but you only find out when you are there, so you are dropped in the world, you run around. When you step on the reward, then you get it, and you get reset. I mean, get reset to the zero, zero point. Another reward might be somewhere else. So if that's the case, what you want is that after you've been dropped in many words, when you are dropped in the next one, then you should say, I should go visit the sem semi-circle and check out where the reward is th this time, rather than randomly move around. And so the right behavior is to inter uh, internalize and to reuse would be going to the semi-cycle. The second example is about the pushing block robots. If you are a pushing robot that's supposed to push a block into the target here, the target is just the green, green square far away. You don't know which block it is. Random motion is not going to get you there or not very quickly. But if you build up a behavior of you always move to a block, then move that block onto the target. See if you get a reward. If you don't, next time you move another block. So finally you find the block that gave you reward and then you zoom in on that one. That's a much better exploratory behavior than random actions. So the question is how, to, how we can get these behaviors to emerge rather than initial exploration, which is pretty random. So here we introduce the latent exploration spaces. So what we want to do is some kind of compression of behaviors, such that we can sample behaviors that are interesting rather than some naive approach. Here's one way to do this. Let's say you have a lot of tasks that you try to solve. Maybe that's different blocks that need to be parsed to a target. Each task has a discrete dis encoding, such as the D here. Let's say you, you were given that encoding. It's just a one hop. You turn into a latest, uh, latent space variable Z, and then fit that into your policy. Uh, policy. It's just a pi, pi theta. 
data is through a parameter, trend parameter, trendable parameter. And we have also the current ob observation taken, uh, taking action. Uh, action is just AT. It's the output of your policy. If you have uh, seen enough of this, then maybe in the future, what will be the case is that you are faced with a new task and you can sample the Z. And by sampling Z, you get some kind of interesting behavior. It might be the wrong interesting behavior, but you will know, and you will sample another Z. So finally, sample the Z gives you the behavior that you want. And you are effectively exploring the space of sample Zs rather than exploring just the action space. This, of course, assumes that, that Sampling Z has a strong relationship with behaviors that you will see. Uh, that's just uh, the Aita, I believe, the right, right, upper, uh, right upper side. That is the behavior you will see. And so you, uh, you want some kind of mutual information. Let's say just MI function. High information content between Z and the sample and the resulting trajectory your policy will have from that. This assumes that you have a bunch of tasks ahead of the time and training against them. It's a bit like training on the ImageNet. And then after that, you fine tune the network on your uh, own task, another task, and hoping that that's going to work. This approach can be uh, applied either way. I mean, you can have some pre-trained model or you can uh, train your model on some existing uh, data, uh, which is created by yourself. For this kind of research, it's probably more interesting to work in state space because the experiments will be a lot faster. And the fundamental challenge is in the state space. And in behavior space, it's not in the observation space. So let's see another approach. So how to force this to happen? How to force the day to be uh, as what we expect? What you can do is, you, uh, is that we are still gonna want it, want it to be the case that there is a Z feeding into the po policy. And depending on the day we sample, we get different behaviors. We're, good, uh, we're gonna put our agent in an environment sample a hundred different Zs, and we sample a hundred different Zs, we will get a hundred different trajectories. We have a hundred trajectories, then we do an update. It's just a training. We have a hundred, uh, maybe a Q learning update or a policy gradient update, and we will get a new policy. We want it to be the case that thanks to data, we can collect it after one gradient update. The policy will be good. And that's the end-to-end -end objective, so that we can just optimize for it. So match our, and it, this just meet our reinforcement learning objective. What we want to have is that if we sample 100 of these, get the trajectories, and then do an update, the re, finally the resulting policy will be good. So here are some experiments. If you, uh, if, you, uh, if you do a bunch of meta training in these environments, in the different environments, where you every time get 100 Z examples, you are trying hopefully after you succeed, but initially you wouldn't, you wouldn't, but after a bunch of meta training, you will be ready and here is what you will get. So there are some training results. When the robot is dropped in the semi-cycle environment again, when you sample Z, there are the different behaviors you get out, which are very good exploratory behaviors, at least for the wild robot. Wild robot is just the first, uh, the first color. So you can see that uh, it's a movement, uh, you must have some rotation and a move forward. That's the style that the wild robot works. And you can see that with this, Strat, uh, strategy, it can uh, usually go back to the semi-cycle trajectory. And second column is for the working robot. 
So it is uh, distinct from the first kind of robot. And the third task is about the uh, pusher. And on the first row, you can see there are some uh, report, uh, experimental reports about the average returns. If it is higher, it means that your uh, trained robot is better. So you can see the blue line is what I just described, the strategy, what I just described. So it is much better, it is much faster than other strategies to achieve some good results to make the robots uh, work to get the rewards. Okay, so what's left for us is the unsupervised skill discovery. So far as we try to learn these exploratory behaviors, the assumption is that you first get to train in an environment where there are still reward, and then later you are faster at learning in a new environment. What if there are never any rewards until later? Can you first have a robot just practice for a long time, learn the internal representations of the word or behaviors, and then for the first time be an environment that has a reward, and immediately it can do well. So maybe this is just what the unsupervised skill discovery want to do. So there are many works uh, roughly does the same things. Uh, and if you look at, at these objectives, they are almost the same, at least similar. The, the experiments they run are not exactly the same. So it's a little hard to compare exactly what's going on. But the gist is the same. The goal is the same. You still have a goal conditional policy. It's just a pie. The latent variable will be some encoding of your current goal. It, will, it could be this secret or it can, could be continuous. It's just a D. And if it is, uh, the, if it is this secret, it can be embedded into a continuous space or afterwards. There is a current observation and the policy is supposed to take an action. And the result is that it will be a tra trajectory after repeating this a few times. What you can say is that if I want interesting behaviors, what I should have is that if I take a different Z, my trajectory should be different. Because if that's the case, then by indexing into the Z space, I can index into the trajectory space. And that will give me better exploration. It doesn't get rid of the notion. And we will see that later that maybe there are a lot of trajectories and not all of them are equally interesting. You don't know about equally interesting here, or you know about here is that you want your trajectories to be diverse. You want to achieve diverse trajectories by indexing to Z space or the secret. So the first paper here in the 2016, this one looked at the secret space indexing high image information through the secret variable in the trajectory. For additional intrinsic control, we look at a high, high informational image between a continuous variable Z and a final state of the trajectory. Then the rest is all you need. Not the final state, not the full trajectory. It's a sign of the mutual information between individual stage and individual time. That's just the third one in the 2018. And then Vola looked at the trajectory as a whole in Z. It's not clear, really clear what's better or what's worse here. I mean, for different objectives, it is hard for you to decide which is the best. It might depend a bit on the setting. It's got a bit of the flavor of the research these days. A lot of people think about uh, similar problems around the same time. And uh, independently takes a slightly different path. So, and so, we have sometimes poor versions of roughly the same high level idea here. So here are some examples of different, uh, different robots uh, trained by this unsupervised uh, learning style. And the first one is Chitai uh, robot. Uh, okay, oh, so it, it may, uh, it cannot run here, but in fact, there are different YouTube videos. Uh, so let me just introduce them briefly. 
uh, Chitty Robot, uh, Chita Robot is a great one to test on um, because it has some really funny behaviors. If you look at the different Z's that you sample, you get a wide range of different behaviors just from the diversity of this paper. And Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then there is an ant. Uh, if you zoom in, you can see that it is an ant robot. It can move to any direction. Uh, from the Vola uh, Balo paper, it's the uh, uh, it's the newest paper. And we see ant is running in different directions for different random seeds or different seeds that are getting fed into it. So we see that indeed we can get diverse behavior indexed by the Z variables. With this, maybe the final one. Uh, oh, it is still about the uh, Chita, just as same as the first one. And here it shows some more complex uh, behaviors than the uh, earlier, earlier slides. So finally, it, uh, this lecture, emphasizes the humanoid uh, robot. It's just uh, similar to humans. So this little robot has many degrees of freedom, many, many more than the uh, robots in the earlier slides, which means that you, have, you can have more trajectories. And if you want high mutual information between they and the trajectory, this robot follows. It turns out that it never gets up and starts running. It means it just uh, keeps there. It loves to be on the floor. There is so much opportunity on the floor to achieve very high motor information for this robot. It's so much easier to achieve, uh, to, to achieve. Our original hope was that at some point you are out of motor information on the floor, not just on the floor. You are gone. You are got uh, you are got to do something that involves running, jumping, and dancing, and some more complex behaviors that I, that a human can do. But with the amount of patience and the compute part that we had so far, all it's done is being on the floor. So it they cannot uh, they cannot work. And we even changed the humanoid to be chubby. I mean, uh, a, fat, a fat person. So so we thought maybe a chubby humanoid and some small humanoid like babies. Like uh, maybe we will decide they need to stand up and start walking versus a really lanky, tall one, I mean a slim one. It might not have an easy time to getting up. But even a chubby one wouldn't. It just uh, wouldn't start running. It would find more and more essentially brick dancing behaviors on the floor rather than just uh, what we want to say. But I think that's where this completely unsupervised skill learning gets tricky. There are some limitations for the unsupervised uh, skill uh, learning. If your space is very high dimensional and there is so much out there to try, I mean, you have many choices, that you need probably a little extra encourage, encouragement to get to something. Um, I mean, some complex behaviors that you want. And that is what you, what is you really want instead of just the mutual information that you designed before. So that's all. Thank you. Okay, so um, that's all for our lectures for this semester. Uh, thank you all for participating and uh, a big round of applause to all of our uh, speakers today for carrying out their duties. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Yeah.